welcome. We have a lot of uh, great information that comes in these sessions, uh, but also, you know, we make sure that we can answer the questions. So make sure that you can type in chat. And when you do type in chat, uh, make sure that everybody can see it if you would like. Uh, otherwise, uh, it'll be private. <laughs> um, all right. So let's go ahead and jump right in. This is the agenda for today's session. We're going to do a brief introduction into who I am. Uh, then we're going to do an overview of the topic at hand. And then we're going to talk about some sales techniques uh, and marketing techniques, which is the whole purpose of today's session. And then we'll have time for the Q&A. So introduction. I'm Sid. I am an ambassador for Cast Iron. I have a business called Sweet Fest, as well as the Sugar Queen Academy, which are all founded upon providing business resources and business information for those of you in the foodie industry. Uh, that means food and beverage. It means cake, cookie, all that stuff. If it's edible, then we are here to help you guys and support you with your businesses, whether you have not started a business or whether you're thinking about starting a business, whether you've been in business for a while, um, all the information that we provide is typically helpful for those of you at any stage in your business journey. Uh, so my background is in finance and accounting. I went to the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill's Kenan Flagler Business School, as well as I went there for undergrad. Um, and I worked for PricewaterhouseCoopers, which is one of the uh, largest public accounting firms in the world. And I uh, was a financial analyst and an expense analyst for Lincoln Financial. So everything related to my background in uh, my career has been related related to finance, accounting, and business. And I also love helping entrepreneurs, small business owners. That's basically where my heart really lies, right? Uh, and so below this line, you'll see uh, the different brands that either I've started or I work with that I'm affiliated with. Uh, so the pink one is Sweet Fest, which was started back in 2014. And then there's the Sugar Coin Academy, as well as the Ultimate Sugar Show. Uh, and those are two brands that I use to support Support you guys in the education space, whether it is online learning or in-person learning, which is what the Ultimate Sugar Show is about. Um, and then we, um, I blog for the Retail Bakers of America, and then I have a business column with the American Cake Decorating Magazine. I also contribute to Pastry Arts Magazine's uh, annual summit, as well as here I am with Cast Iron, and I promote uh, you know, basically their products as well as helping to support the business education on their blog, as well as on social media and all that fun stuff, which is why you are here. Whew. All right. So that's a strong introduction. Matter of fact, I feel like we should use that introduction for everyone going forward. <laughs> and we say reference back to episode eight. I think that's what we're going to do. Also behind the scenes is my girl, Emily. Uh, and she is basically my counterpart uh, over at Cast Iron. And she is here to support you all with either setting up your store or with any questions that you may have related to the features uh, or related to how things work at Cast Iron. So definitely make sure you mark down or take a screenshot of help plus cooking up sales at castiron.me, which is where you can reach her if you have any additional questions. Um, also, if you are not watching this uh, on YouTube yet, then uh, make sure that you go follow, subscribe, all that good stuff over on YouTube. If you are watching on YouTube, make sure that you hit that like button, uh, the thumbs up, then hit that subscribe button and all the things that all the YouTubers say. Uh, but also you can look up previous sessions by going to Cast Iron HQ, uh, searching for that over on YouTube. All right. Okay, so here is the overview for today. In this session, we will be discussing techniques that can improve sales in your food business this spring, like literally it just turned spring. Uh, so I wanted to make sure that we all are prepared uh, for the spring celebrations and spring festivities, all right? Um, although, as a matter of fact, let me move this so that I can see. Sorry, I couldn't see there. Um, uh, although at the end of 
Although the end of year holidays can be a huge revenue driver, the spring also has its own set of financial opportunities, as we will discuss. As the weather gets warmer, people tend to be outdoors more and attend activities with their friends and family, such as festivals, farmers markets, and other uh, celebrations, which usually involve food. All right, so some examples of spring related celebrations are graduation, Easter, that's supposed to be prom with the uh, dress and the tuxedo. Uh, the, you know, prom season is around as well as Mother's Day and Father's Day. Uh, so there's all kinds of celebrations that happen throughout this time. These are not just the only ones. Obviously, there's going to continue to be birthdays. There's going to continue to be, uh, you know, weddings and bridal showers and baby showers and all that kind of stuff. Uh, but these are some of the more popular spring festivities. In order to optimize your chances of increasing your sales this spring, in this session, we will discuss six sales and marketing techniques. Now, as you are writing your notes, you will come to realize that there are actually five and one of them has two parts, but I included that as six, just for those who want to be technical. <laughs> <laughs> um, also, uh, I realized as I was going through the notes for this, that some of the information that would be foundational in helping you uh, with growing your business and growing your sales this spring um, are actually, we've covered quite a bit. I can't believe, like I said, this is the eighth session that we've had. Um, and even if we go all the way back to the first one, which is the five mistake, five marketing mistakes that slow down your baking business. Um, if you go and check that one out, I talk about some really strong techniques that you can use as well related to sales um, that also can go hand in hand with what we're going to talk about today. So make sure that you check out the playlist over on the YouTube channel at Cast Iron HQ. So the first technique we're going to talk about talk about is simplifying the process. All right. I want you to simplify the process this spring. That's something that's going to roll over with you throughout the rest of the year. This is really in general, but also starting now in the spring, simplify the process. OK, the first point, remember, I said that one of the points had two parts. First point to that is to standardize your menu. When I say standardize your menu, I recommend that you create a menu that offers popular selections while still limiting the customer's options. We're going to talk about why you should do that here in just a second. OK, a perk of standardizing your menu is that it allows you to be better prepared with supplies and ingredients on hand, and it makes production more efficient. I don't remember if I talked about this before, but I always think about Cheesecake Factory uh, when it talks, when I think about menu offering and menu options. And I really wonder, like, how big is the kitchen? <laughs> How big is the pantry? How big is the refrigerator in the Cheesecake Factory? Because at the Cheesecake Factory, they have so many options. They offer Asian cuisine, Italian cuisine, American cuisine. They have all kinds of things that run the gambit. Uh, and they must have a lot of space in order to be able to provide you know, the most random thing on the menu, if someone random, that one person orders that in that particular uh, dinner session, right? And I know that most of you don't have that type of resource to be able to offer all the things all the time. And so when you limit your menu and you standardize your menu, that allows you to be able to be efficient with what you can offer, as well as have the freshest ingredients available and things not going old. When you have a broad menu, if it, it can Look, when you have a broad menu, it can be difficult to keep fresh supplies and ingredients on hand to meet possible demand for certain menu items, like we expressed with Cheesecake Factory, although Cheesecake Factory is yummy. Uh, a standard menu will also help you to hire and train staff. So remember, we were talking about having the efficiency. If you limit your menu to a certain style, a certain design, um, or just a certain you know flavor, then you can train people specifically for those items, and they can get really good at those items, right? So if you make it not too complicated, not too fancy, or let's say if you do have a fancy design, but then you have a technique about how you do it, then you can teach that to other people who can basically come in and do it for you so that you won't have to continue to be a one-person show. 
when it comes to spring celebrations, develop a limited menu or portfolio of designs that customers can choose from. This is also something that is helpful when it comes to having a different set, like a different part of your business, such as if you want to um, expand into offering wedding cakes or expand into having celebration cakes, having a limited portfolio of designs that you offer throughout a particular season can also help you with, like I said, uh, farming that out to uh, staff or just offering different things uh, kind of, you know, more broadly. And then also, um, this will ultimately make the customer decision process easier because you've narrowed down the menu. Like I said, using the Cheesecake Factory. If you've never been to the Cheesecake Factory, you could be overwhelmed with decision fatigue, trying to figure out what exactly you want on the menu. But if it was just one sheet, then we already know that this is what we have to pick from and it's gonna be so much easier for me to decide as the customer, okay? So having a limited menu will ultimately make the customer decision process easier and increase the likelihood that they will purchase from your business. Part two to the simplifying the process is to use good systems. Nothing kills online sales faster than bad systems. What are the markers of bad systems versus good systems? Also, let's go on a side note. I had to find a Halloween RIP headstone related <laughs> picture for this one. I thought it I thought it fit in perfectly because really nothing kills online sales faster than horrible systems, right? It makes it to where people don't purchase or people struggle to purchase or people get frustrated. And you want to make sure that you have good systems in place if you want to be able to have not only uh, strong sales and increased sales, but sales period. Bad systems versus good systems. We're going to go down a general overview of what those look like. Okay, so bad systems are complicated to the user experience and good systems will have a clean layout. Now, when I say a bad system has complicated user experience, I'm not just talking about for the customer. I'm also talking about for you as the administrator of the system. Things may be complicated. You may have trouble figuring out how to uh add certain you know, products to your system or how to uh, stay organized. The bad, the, user, the bad user experience is something that is going to really kind of hinder your efficiency as well as make the customer not wanna buy, okay? Whereas if you have a clean layout, there's buttons, there's an easy path uh, for the customer journey, that's going to be a marker of a good system. Poor instructions for a bad system versus clear instruct clear instructions for a good system. All right. So poor instructions, such as um, you know, you let's say you post on your social media, hey, just click my link in bio, and then they click the link in bio, and there's no clear direction as to where they should go. Um, there's no clear answer as to how they place an order. Uh, or you give too many steps as to, and I think I'm stepping on my toes on another point, uh, you give too many steps that may be too hard to follow for folks or too hard for them to remember as to what they should do in order to place an order. That is a bad system, okay? Clear instructions is is go to my website, tap the first button on the screen, right? Or tap the green button on my page or something like that, right? So something that is very clear, uh, directions to folks, if you start giving people instructions and there's more than three, I can assure you they will get lost. Uh, again, too many steps versus very few steps. I feel like that's pretty clear, but I've definitely uh, been in a position to where I've seen folks in our industry say, well, you have to send me an email and you need to tell me which time slot you want and um, what flavor you want and the quantity. And then you need to send me your cash app name and all the different things, right? If there's too many steps, then people are going to get lost and they're not going to purchase from you. All right. So make sure that you have few steps and make it very easy for people to get to the place where they can give you their money. Um, a bad system is going to force you to have extra communication that could probably be avoided, all right? A good system is going to have automated or very few communications where you manually have to do the work, okay? So extra communications is bad. Automated communications or very few manual communications 
are good, all right? When I say extra, I mean that back and forth that we all know and hate when it comes to uh, dealing with customer issues. So an example of a bad system uh, is selling your products via email with a ton of back and forth. We've already touched on that. Using manual spreadsheets to keep yourself organized that's not really a good system because what happens when someone cancels or someone changes uh, their pickup time or uh, someone wants to change their flavor, then it is on you to manually figure out how is it that I'm going like to remember to change that thing on your spreadsheet. Or what if your assistant hears about it and this is at the very end of their you know shift or whatever and they don't update the spreadsheet and now there's a big mistake. So when it relies on you to manually do a lot of work, that's not a really great system, okay? Um, and then also a bad system would be having, let's say you have an online store, but you have uh, your sales, you know, buttons are buried within multiple different areas, right? So let's say I go to your page and then I click a button, but then that button is not immediately adding it to my cart. That button is not making it to where uh, my customer can check out. It's where that button leads them to another page where they have to read another description and then they can click another button and then that leads them to somewhere else. And it's not just a clear one-step process, all right? So bearing your products on your website and requiring multiple button clicks, that's not really a great system. So an example of a good system is able to easily track your orders with minimal manual updates. So if somebody needs to change something uh, or if you need to cancel something, then you know there's a, an easier process, a streamlined process for that management system. Okay. Um, very few steps for customers to purchase. So like I said, instead of having a button that leads to a button that leads to a button, having just the one button that makes it to where it adds to cart and then they can check out, okay? Um, also automated communications, feedback and social sharing, all of those things being automated um, or you know done for you, that's also gonna be the marker of a good system, okay? So it's gonna be no surprise. <laughs> <laughs> it's going to be no surprise that my good system recommendation is cast iron, um, something that I even discovered literally like this week. Uh, was that cast iron has where when they do the fulfillment email that sends out to your customers within that there's already information that's built in for your customer for them to share with their friends for them to provide you feedback all of those good things. And so uh, definitely take advantage of that. Like I said, that is helping with the communication piece that's doing it for you, as opposed to you having to remember to send out an email follow up later asking for feedback. Okay. Um, so uh, no surprise, Cast Iron is my recommendation. It has all the features you need to run a successful food business. And I'm not just saying that because this is cooking up sales with Cast Iron. I'm saying that because it's very true, all right? Um, so you can, it includes a website builder. It has the order management system. You can automate certain processes, has payment processing for you and all other kinds of features. As a matter of fact, Earlier last week, Emily and I were over on the Sweet Fest page on Instagram, that's sweet underscore fest, and we had a session where we chatted about the features that are currently on Cast Iron and also the features that may be coming down the pipeline and even some things that we wish were there that maybe they can work on later. So definitely watch that replay. If you want to get a high-level overview of some of the features, you can also go to castiron.me as well to learn more about some of the features as well. But I'm trying to tell you that if you want a good system, them, then cast iron is going to be a really great bet for you. And if you already have a website, it's very easy for you to kind of put those two together because let's say you have a website over on Sugar Web Space, you can literally add a button on your navigation bar that says shop my store or just shop and then have that button go directly to your cast iron store so that people can purchase from you so that you have your systems uh, working for you. All right. Community outreach. Community outreach is another thing, too, that can help you with your sales. All right. Getting involved in your community is a great way to increase sales for a variety of reasons. 
You can network with other businesses. You can meet other business owners and figure out what audiences that you have that kind of overlap and connect with each other. Um, you can figure out if there's some similarities, some ways that you can partner together, some ways that you could support each other. Uh, so networking with other businesses is a great way, uh, a great reason why you should also be out in your community doing things. Um, it also gives you an opportunity to connect with your tribe. OK, um, and especially if you are new in business and you're trying to build a tribe and you're trying to make those real relationships and connections with people in your community, uh, you want to get out there because sitting uh, behind the you know desk at your storefront or behind the counter at your storefront is not necessarily going to get you connected to the right people in your community. You have to get out and about. Another piece is to showcase your products. So sometimes people just haven't had a chance to taste your product or see your services in action. They, maybe they've never been to a wedding that you've catered. Um, maybe they've never been to a, a birthday party that had a cake from you. And so if you are out in your community, then you can have the opportunity to showcase your products as well as your services to let people know exactly what it is that you offer and how delicious it is. Um, another benefit too is to increase your visibility. Obviously, if you are out in front of people, then you are more visible. They're more likely to do business with you. They're more likely to be interested in what you have to offer. And then finally, you can actually get sales. <laughs> you can actually get sales when you are out and about in your community community, whether that is at a farmer's market or whether that's um, at some type of festival or event. Like we said, things are starting to warm up outside. As you get involved with more uh, activities within your community, you can actually make on-site sales as well as future sales uh, for larger events. Community outreach ideas. So these are things that kind of hopefully can get your ideas flowing as to how you can connect with your community. Um, you can volunteer with certain organizations within your area. I know a lot of times people do like Habitat for Humanity or maybe they'll help with like some uh, food drive or something like that. But volunteering and maybe even doing that as a company, as a brand uh, can help get your name out there as well as can get you involved within your community. Um, you can sponsor certain events. So like maybe there is um, some type of uh, fundraiser race or, uh, you know, like a 5K, or maybe there's some type of event that's going on for some type of charity in your area. Maybe you sponsor the treats. Maybe you actually give a financial donation in order, and I even said donate on here, but you give some type of uh, financial contribution in order to uh, have your brand put forward, because generally when you sponsor, your, your name, your logo is usually right out there in front for people to see. You'll usually get a shout out uh, depending upon what your sponsorship deal is, but it gives you an opportunity to be visible to people and to let people know that we are here and we offer these type of things, all right? So uh, you can not only volunteer, you can sponsor, you can also donate, whether that is maybe donating, um, you know, at the end of the day, let's say you have, you know, uh, you know, you're not going to continue to put certain things in the case at the end of the week. You don't, you know, not to say that they're bad, but they're also not what you would quality would see as quality to sell, uh, then maybe you donate them to a food bank or to a church or to some type of organization that gives uh, to those who um, are struggling with hunger. So, you know, you can have that opportunity to donate and also get your name out there and again, connect with your community as well. As it relates to being in your community, you can exhibit or you can bin, like I said, farmer's markets, festivals, those type of things that'll also get you money as well as putting you out there visibly in front of your community. And then also finally hosting an event. So let's say that there are activities that maybe you're not, don't have an opportunity to get involved in, but you have an idea for something that you would like to do. So maybe, uh, especially with the spring, maybe you have some type of Easter bunny event, or maybe you have some type of uh, Easter egg hunt on your uh, property, or you, you know, again, sponsor or partner with some other a uh, place that maybe has a facility if you don't have a facility to do some type of Easter egg hunt, uh, but something fun that can support your community, whether that is a large scale graduation party uh, for those, like let's say if you're in a small community, for instance, in my hometown, there is um, maybe two high schools. So really what they could do, and there's really a one main city high school and one, one county high school, they could do like a full graduation party uh, hosted by 
by uh, Sid's Sweet Treats, right? So it's something that you could think think of that can offer as an event to your community. Collaborate with others. Collaborating with others, businesses, as well as influencers in your community can not only increase sales, but it's also a great way to reach a different audience. Take some time to research businesses or local influencers who share your target audience and contact them with a person with a proposal to collaborate. And I strategically picked, and I don't know, can I maybe I can zoom in? Hopefully you guys can see this. Um, I strategically picked these set of pictures to kind of show as examples of uh, businesses that are probably really good for you to partner with. Uh, so for instance, if you are uh, a wedding cake designer, see if you could partner with, um, you know, a, a, uh, a bridal boutique, maybe you do some type of, you know, uh, tasting event there. Um, again, it adds value to their customers as well as to your customers, right? Um, maybe a floral shop, that's the one on the right. So if you partner with a floral Oral boutique, maybe you do some type of package for Mother's Day or for Father's Day or for graduations where you offer some type of treat that goes with um, a type of floral bouquet. Okay. Um, also down at the bottom on the left, um, you know, I was thinking of other crafting type stores. Um, I know there are several around in my area where you can go and you can knit or you can sew or you can paint. Uh, so maybe you provide some type of activity where you collaborate on like some Mother's Day gift package where mom can go to wine and design and then we offer the treats to go with it. Um, so, you know, these are things that you can just kind of, uh, you know, stir around your head, even for instance, like with an Easter egg type thing for Easter, right? So maybe you have some type of uh, collaboration with one of those paint type, you know, boutiques, and then you offer chocolate eggs that people can, you know, eat while they're painting, or you can do some type of uh, DIY paint cookie set and you offer the cookie set for them to do at that place. Um, so I'm just throwing out ideas, but these are things that you can do to try to collaborate with other companies. Um, and then as well, this is a coffee shop, little cafe, then maybe you provide treats for them um, on some other scale, whether that's for whatever the holiday is, or even just outside of the holidays, maybe you can form a collaboration for that as well. And that gives you an opportunity to reach their audience um, and add value to them as well. When proposing a collaboration with a potential partner, focus on ways that you can support each other, all right? So don't just come in and say, hey, I want to use your space because it's about my business and I want to grow my business. No, you need to come to them in a way that says, hey, I offer a service. Here's what I think we can do with each other. Here's how I can support you and your business. Here's how I can enhance your customer experience, so on and so forth. Now, mind you, the people you're proposing it to, they're going to know that that you're going to get something out of it as well, but also don't come um, to it as if it's just one-sided for me, 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 and not for a collaboration, okay? Um, ask yourself, in what ways will your product or services add value to your shared customer base, okay? All right, um, and then also inspire your tribe, okay? Another point is to inspire your tribe. Sharing content on social media, or your website that adds value to your customer can increase customer loyalty and improve sales. Um, and I use these pictures to kind of identify some things that maybe can spark ideas for them, right? So maybe there's a mom brunch that you inspire them to have, or maybe you help with figuring out how to plan a graduation celebration. Consider sharing gift inspirations, party planning tips, or a gift guide to help your customers with upcoming spring festivities. All right, those are always going to be great things that are going to help people. Finally, promote now, but start now, <laughs> like after we get off of here <laughs> or maybe starting tomorrow, uh, figuring out exactly what you want to do. Okay. Sooner is better than later when it comes to getting the word out regarding your spring promotions and menu updates. So here's some promotion prep ideas. Here's some ways that you can get ready for what you're going to promote uh, later this spring celebration season, all right? Um, so one, I want you to dig up old but relevant content, 
All right. So uh, usually, and again, this is what I love about holidays. And it's what I love about things that are annual is that sometimes the work is already doing, done for me, right? So maybe last year, I really invested in doing some type of beautiful photo shoot uh, for my bakery or for, um, you know, the menu items that I had. I can dig back up those old photos um, and use those to help with promoting what's going to happen this year. All right. So dig up old but relevant content, right? Uh, you can plan a photo shoot. So let's say that you weren't in business last year and now this is a brand new business. You can actually plan to, you know, have a specific photo shoot or video shoot uh, for your menu or the things that you're going to offer during this season, all right? Um, that could be a professional photo shoot. That could be you learning how to take your own pictures, um, whichever way works for you and your budget create slash update your menu. Now, some of you may decide, I don't want to change my menu. I'm not trying to offer a spring menu. That's cool. But going back to my original point about limiting things, especially when it comes to, um, you know, specific celebrations. So if you're going to try to offer a graduation menu or gr graduation promo or a Mother's Day promo or a Father's Day promo, you want to make sure that you limit things. So figure out what it is that you're going to offer in that regard. So maybe not your regular menu, but like your promotional special holiday menu. And then also something you can do to prep is to just tease out significant dates. So let's say that you're not ready to take on Father's Day orders yet, but you know that it's coming. Then you can go ahead and start putting those dates out there. Hey guys, starting, you know, May 31st, we're going to start, we're going to open up for Father's Day uh, gifts or Father's Day treats or whatever, our Father's Day cookie set. Okay. Um, so in the same way, you can tease those things out, even if you're not ready to start taking those orders. Um, even just like, for instance, when the holidays come around at the end of the year, um, you know, there's posts that come out and say, hey, you know, Christmas is such and such weeks away or uh, New Year's is such and such weeks away or days away or whatever, you can start doing those teaser posts as well, um, either in your email or on your, on, or on your social media, okay? Okay, uh, when working to increase sales in your business, please keep in mind the marketing rule of seven, which states that a potential customer must see a message at least seven times before they'll be provoked to take an action. In reality, this number could be larger, it could be smaller. Um, however, I want you to keep this principle in mind when running your business because it will likely take more than one post on social media to make an actual financial impact on your business. And I say this because I see a lot of people, especially when they're new, get very frustrated. Well, I posted on social media and nobody purchased from me. Well, yeah, did you post, Did you just post it the one time? And did you post it at that one time at 11.30 p.m.? Like, <laughs> at what point... Uh, were you trying to promote it? And did you do it multiple times? Did people have enough lead up time to prepare? Um, or were you the last uh, thing on their list because they had already heard from another baker or crafty person or creative um, earlier in the season and purchased from them before they had a chance to purchase from you? So I'm just saying to put this out here so that you can kind of manage your expectations as well as, um, you know, be prepared uh, down the road so that you can go ahead and like I said, promote sooner so that you can get that money and you can be the person that they purchase from. So we're gonna do a recap. For those of you who've never, who like been in <laughs> the cooking of sales before, you knew the recap wasn't really the recap first, right? So first, before we do the recap of what we just talked about, I'm gonna tell you some things that you might have missed leading up to like in within the last time, you know, let's say the episode seven and episode eight, which is where we are now, right? So what have you missed since then? Uh, we posted on the blog. So I shared an article on uh, the Cast Iron blog, accounting and tax prep tips for food business owners. Um, so you're just going to go to castiron.me slash blog, and you'll see all the blog posts that are on there. Um, you may have to go, you know, down a couple of rows, but it is on there. Um, and especially since it is tax season, if you haven't you know, planned or prepared your taxes for this year. This is also going to be helpful for preparing for taxes for future years. So make sure that you check it out regardless of whether you filed your taxes yet or not. Okay. So this is the accounting and tax prep tips for food business owners written by an accountant. Okay. 
Um, also, like I said, Emily and I were on Instagram on uh, last week, and we were on the Instagram page, sweet underscore fest, where we talked about some of the features that Cast Iron already has, some features that are coming down the pipeline, as well as we were trying to give a, a nice little wish list to, uh, you know, add to their already growing things that they're already working on behind the scenes. All right. So check that out. Watch the replay. Listen to the replay. You don't really have to physically watch it. You can just have it on in the background while you're in the kitchen and just listening to it because we had a nice little chat. Also, next month, uh, April 19th, so go ahead and mark your calendar now, April 19th is the next uh, Cooking Up Sales, so we're going to be talking about winning new business. I posted on my Instagram page asking you guys what it is you feel like you really need help with, and the top answer was getting new customers and winning new business, and so we're going to be talking about that on April 19th. So finally, um, the actual recap of the content from today uh, spring sales and marketing techniques. Number one is to simplify the buying process. Uh, and within that, it means to create a standard menu as well as using good systems. Of course, the good system is cast iron. If you haven't started your cast iron store, go ahead and go to castiron.me. Make sure that you hang out there. Just literally sign up. It does not take a lot of time. Matter of fact, I believe it's like episode three or four in the playlist that I've been talking about where I actually walk through creating a store. It took me like maybe 30 minutes only because I was literally doing it on a webinar. If I was doing it without a webinar, I which I have done before, it took me about 10 or 15 minutes. All right. So that being said, uh, figure out the good system, which is cast iron, go ahead and create you an account um, and then use that to make a whole bunch of money, not only just this season, but throughout the rest of the time, throughout the rest of the year, okay? Um, get involved in your community. Get involved in, uh, you know, nonprofit organizations, start hosting your own events, uh, collaborate with other folks in your community, which is also the point right under that. Um, but basically get yourself out there. You are a part of that community and people need to know that you exist. And there are people who are looking to support local businesses. They're not going to support a local business that they don't know exists. OK, so get out there, put yourself out there. All right. Collaborate with others, not just other businesses that share your audience, but also influencers that share your audience. Um, I'll give you an example. I believe it was Mother's Day last year. Um, I went to an event from a friend of mine in Atlanta who has a cheesecake uh, cheesecake storefront. Well, she has a bakery, but she focuses on cheesecake and milkshakes. But um, for Mother's Day, she hosted a brunch in partnership with a social media influencer out of Atlanta who was a foodie. And so he had his um, crowd come. She had her crowd come. And it was a really great event. It was very yummy. All right. So that's something that you can consider as well, especially if you have a sp physical space. If you don't have a physical space, then figure out how you can rent out a venue, use a, a Verbo or, or whatever to do whatever type of event you need. Share content that inspires action. So whether that is on your blog, whether that's in your email list, whether that is on your social media, share content that will inspire people to want to purchase from you, whether that is the party planning tips, whether that is a gift guide, something that will add value to your customer because that will make them want to continue to do business with you. And then finally, prepare and or start promoting, all right? Do it now. Go ahead and dig through the crates, dig through the albums in your photo, in your phone, uh, dig through, you know, the archives on your social media to find um, some really good pictures that you can use or go ahead and contact that photographer that you've already flagged over on social media that you said you're going to work with um, and schedule time with them to make sure that you can get everything lined up or even take a photography class uh, so that you can be prepared to take better pictures for the spring of your menu items. Okay. That was awesome, Sid. So many good ideas. My gosh, I feel like I should go start a business and like go hang out at my farmer's market. <laughs> <laughs> Although I hang out at the farmer's market on um, once it's, you know, summer market season anyway. So. <laughs> That's great. I'm so glad that you guys liked it. I've, I know I've, I started off by saying it was sales techniques. Then I realized it may be more marketing techniques, but those like go hand in hand so much. Yeah. Yeah. Sales is marketing. Marketing is sales. Um, first question is uh, kind of related to your first 
section, uh, how do you narrow down your menu without scaring away customers? Um, you know, for the spring, if you maybe typically offer three kinds of things, but you're like, oh, actually, I think based on my priorities and how many orders I think I might get, I need to narrow that down to one or two different product types. Um, I, I think a lot of people would be scared that like, oh my gosh, well, what if, you know, Joe from around the block really loves cupcakes and I decide not to do cupcakes, then like, I'm not making a sale there. Like, yes, how do you, yes. how do you do that without scaring away customers? Yes. Well, so first you want to look at your popular items, right? So try to figure out like, what are the things that everybody or the majority of people absolutely love and then figure out how to put a spring like twist on it, right? Or a Mother's Day twist on it, right? So if you know that vanilla cupcakes or vanilla, you know, just regular sugar cookies or whatever is your typical thing that everybody loves, then you put a cute little fondant flower on it, right? And that makes it the Mother's Day or the spring cupcake, right? So, um, you know, it's, it, yes, Joe down the street may be like, well, where's my red velvet, right? <laughs> Well, Joe, come back for Father's Day and we'll have your red velvet. <laughs> All right. But, you know, I think at this point, people um, and especially, I, you know, I like to say you treat you teach people how to treat you. Right. And so, you know, as you are, you know, growing your business, you kind of make it into what you want it to be. And so people will get used to, well, such and such is not offered at this time of the year at Sid Sweet Treats. Just like I know right now, I cannot go to Chick-fil-A and get a peppermint milkshake. I've got to wait until at least November or October, right? And so if you at least, you know, start grooming people to understand that this is something that literally we are only offering it for this time of the year, um, then I think, you know, they won't just leave you forever. <laughs> They'll be back. <laughs> and if you get that feedback, that's good feedback from, you know, if, if multiple people are saying, hey, I really wish you had red velvet, then you, I guess you can take that and use it for, for the next yeah. holiday. <laughs> <laughs> right, exactly. You know, and and I I mean, when I say limit the menu, I'm not saying that, you know, um I'm not saying you don't offer vanilla, you don't offer chocolate. I'm saying like, you know, strawberry or pumpkin spice or whatever, right? Or you start offering vanilla in different ways, right? So you have a vanilla cupcake and then maybe you have like a vanilla mini cake, right? Because that's still the same batter. It's just poured, you know, it's just baked a little differently. It's baked in a pan versus baked in, you know, cupcake. Yeah, work work smarter, not harder. Yes, <laughs> that's definitely. the name of the game. Definitely. Um, other question is how do you, how would I know if a community outreach event like a farmer's market, um, how do I know that they have my right customer there? How do I know that the person who's really going to buy from Sid Sweet Treats uh, is is at that event? Right. So that's the challenge uh, with being new in certain events and activities. Um, and honestly, it's really just part of the marketing research game. Right. So um, I would like to say that and I know that we all come from, you know, having limited budgets, right? Like nobody has uh, an unlimited budget of how they could market their business. So um, I would say definitely make sure that it fits within your budget and that it's not something that is going to be I have to win big when I go to this farmer's market. Like, don't let it be that it's got to be do or die at this farmer's market. But, you know, make it to where you have a nice little cushion so that we have some money that we can invest in going to this bridal show or going to this farmer's market or going to, you know, participating in this big festival. Um, so then now we can know exactly what it is we're looking for. Also, if you have option, if you have the opportunity to see a prior vendor list, see if you can check that out. Ask those people, how did it go for them? Some people may not be open to answering those questions, but then you may find the rare person who is willing to share what their experience was like 
like as well. Um, so then you can say, well, this is probably going to be a good fit for me versus not a good fit for me. Um, also, I think to uh, the next session that we have when it comes to like getting new business, I feel like we can really dig into some of that a little bit more about like, where do you go? How do you find the people that are look that you think will fit for you, right? So for instance, if I focus on weddings, right? And I'll, I'll always love to, you know, I always love to do weddings, but let's say I focus on wedding cake designs. I don't do celebration cakes. I don't do birthday cakes. I don't do children's cakes at all, right? Then it doesn't make any sense for me to participate in, you know, the kids toy festival, you know, in Marietta, right? Like I need to participate in the bridal expo that's happening at the Cog Galleria. Like, it just makes sense, right? But that's got to be where you know who your audience is, so then you can know where to find them. And like I said, we'll definitely touch on that uh, in the next session. Yeah. And as your business grows, you'll probably start getting outreach from these event organizers. And, you know, they, they're trying to make money. Like, yes. they're a business too. So, like, they yes. are less concerned a lot of the times with who, what kind of business, who is like Sid, what is her target market? So yeah, definitely something to watch out for and like ask questions about before you sign on to an expensive booth or anything sure. like that. True. No, that is a really good point too, um, that, you know, the more visible you are, the more you will get connected to other outlets. Like I said, networking is a big part of being out and about in your community. And for instance, when I first started with being with Sweetfest, or, you know, creating Sweetfest, I knew nobody in the industry. I, I mean, like I had two friends who were like cake decorators, but I didn't know anybody who'd been on Food Network. I didn't know anybody who competed, none of that, right? But I made it a point to start going to cake shows and being involved in cake groups on Facebook and, you know, being out and about within our food community. And then that's how I got plugged into now this is the person you need to know and you should talk to this person and you should be a part of this event. And so just putting yourself out there is automatically going to get you plugged in uh, to some places. Now you'll figure out whether they're the right places or not, <laughs> but but they'll get you plugged in to some places. Yeah. Um, one last question, if unless anybody else has any, uh, definitely drop them in the Q&A or the chat. Um, but you mentioned budgets in your answer to the last question. Um, do you recommend doing any sort of ads or anything paid to promote spring sales? Do you think that that's a good use of these type budgets? I'm going to say yes with an asterisk. Okay. So, um, and the, the great thing too about like online, like ads right now is that you can still do some, you can reach quite a few people and not have to spend thousands of dollars, right? Like you can take like a hundred dollars for Facebook ads, spread it across a month, right? Of just promoting to, to people, right? But my asterisk is that you make sure that you niche down to your appropriate audience, right? Like, so don't just, you you had like a really great post on Instagram and then they're like, you should boost this post. Like, don't just boost the post, okay? <laughs> like, like actually set up an audience so that you know that your ad is going to the right people because it will be a waste of money if you didn't actually set up the appropriate audience. And by that, I mean, like you can you can go into, I think it's, I don't even know what they call it anymore, Facebook business manager, Facebook business, I don't know, the business part of Facebook, right? Like so you can actually go on your computer, go into the back end of your Facebook page and set up an actual audience for your ad, okay? And you're going to do like, you know, I want people within the, you know, Marietta, Georgia, within a five mile radius who are moms from 25 to 65 or from 25 to 45, like niche it down that much so that you can make sure that your, your dollars are being spent effectively and efficiently. 
right? As opposed to showcasing your ad to somebody in Washington state when you are in Atlanta, Georgia, because that is just wasting your money. Yeah. And Facebook will take your money and run. They will, you know, yeah. they, yeah, they'll, they'll go crazy. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes. They don't, they don't care whether you actually set it up. That's why they have this cute little button that just says boost post. And they're like, you know, yeah, sure. We'll boost your post. We'll share it to everybody all over the world. We'll share it to people in Ireland. Nobody in Ireland yeah. is purchasing it. Yep. From you. you might get a million likes on your post, but that's not going to give you a single sale. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. You got it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Cool. Well, those are all the questions we have. So I'll I'll kick it back over to you, Sid. Sounds good. Well, thank you. Emily, can you believe though that this is the eighth episode? No, time has flown. <laughs> oh my gosh. Like I literally was looking at the playlist and I was like, okay, episode eight. Okay. I know. That's intense. See, like that is you have shared that. so much good information with with our audience. So okay. I hope that everyone really got something out of this and definitely check out our YouTube channel or all of our, all of the cooking up sales videos are also on our blog. So when you're checking out Sid's, uh, you know, accounting and, and bookkeeping tips, you know, just keep scrolling and you'll find cooking up sales too. Um, yeah, and we did just stuff. post actually a new uh, blog. Sid's other, she wrote two blogs for us. We just posted the other one today. Um, so that's about bookkeeping and whether or not you should uh, outsource your your bookkeeping or do it yourself. So really good read there too. <laughs> yes. So there's so much content. Like Emily and I have been working really closely to make sure that you guys have you know, good quality business education. Um, it's not just me and some other folks who are within the group as well, some other coaches that are helping out as well. Um, so definitely make sure that you use these resources. They're provided to you guys for free to help you guys with making money uh, in your foodie businesses. So definitely make sure that you use those resources that are available to you. So um, thank you guys so much for hanging out and for chatting with us and for, you know, taking notes and all that good stuff. Make sure that you keep an eye out for the next session. Uh, like I said, we'll be on April 19th, 2023. Um, and we'll have the Zoom link and, you know, all that kind of stuff out there for you guys as well. Um, and if you're watching this replay and it is before April 19th, go to castiron.me slash sweetfest and you can actually sign up for the webinar there as well. All right. So if you guys have a great rest of your evening, thank you so much for watching live as well as watching the replay. If you're watching the replay, make sure you give us a thumbs up and definitely subscribe to the channel. All right. Bye, everybody. Have